Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a lot of different educational things planned for you. My name is Sean Dombrowski, and I'm the Joint Coordinator Nurse at Stevens Point Orthopedics. And I hope everyone can hear me. As the mom of four boys, I typically usually don't need a microphone. So we're gonna start off with a little bit of housekeeping to start with. The bathrooms are located off to the side of the main entrance where you came in. We do have complimentary food as well as coffee and soda for you. If you would like to self-purchase an adult beverage, you are certainly free to do so. I do ask that you please fill out the survey before you leave, and when you turn that in, we will reward you with a thank you gift. So at any time this evening, please feel free to get up and to go to any of our tables. And at this time, I would like to introduce the tables that we have for you. In the back where you checked in, we have Anne and Mallory. So at any time this evening, if you would like to book an appointment with any one of our providers, they can get that appointment booked for you so you can have that appointment card in hand. We also have Kyle, who is the director of our Ambulatory Surgery Center, as well as Jenny, and they are fantastic nurses that take good care of our patients at the Ambulatory Surgery Center. We also have Kevin from D1, and he wanted to come up, I believe, and uh, just let you know what he has for you. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. So I'm Kevin Kirschbaum, the general manager and co-owner of D1 Training. So we are a fitness facility right here in Stevens Point. And uh, you're welcome to come talk to us at the table. We will be chatting about preoperative strength training and just continuing fitness, fitness after surgery. So we'll be happy to chat with you and introduce you, tell you about D1. Hello, my name is uh, Kaylee Clark and I work at D1. I'm one of the coaches and if you were to come to me before surgery for training, you would interact with me and I would work on some things to uh, strengthen the muscles around your joints and make sure that we get you ready to go post-surgery. I'm also a nutrition coach and my emphasis is on anti-inflammatory foods and beverages and things to help you feel really good before, during, and after surgery. Thank you. So I'm frequently asked what is a medical or what is a joint coordinator? So I compare it to being a medical concierge. So while having a joint replacement is one of the most common orthopedic surgeries, we do recognize that this is a new experience for you. So we are committed to making your journey as smooth as possible. This includes meeting with you before your surgery two to three weeks beforehand and unlike other facilities where they send you off to a mandatory joint camp at the hospital where you're part of a group of 20 or 30 people, we find that it's much more beneficial to meet with you individually. This allows me to get to know you better and to address your individual questions or concerns that you have. And together we will identify what is the best discharge plan for you after your surgery. For some people, that may include outpatient physical therapy after surgery, and other people may elect to do home health therapy where a nurse and physical therapy initially come to see you at your home. And I will see you after you have your surgery as well as following up with you for several weeks afterwards. You will also be given my direct cell number. I mean, how many times do you leave the doctor's office and you forget to ask a question? or you're wondering if something is normal after surgery. So I will, call, I will follow you very closely. And one of my favorite things is at the end of your joint journey, we have a celebration picnic where you get to meet with the orthopedic surgeon as well as the physical therapist and we celebrate your hard work. Now I'm very fortunate that we have six extraordinary orthopedic surgeons at Stevens Point Orthopedics five of who specialize in doing joint replacements. All five of them will be presenting this evening. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Todd Williams. Well, 
welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone coming out uh, here tonight. Um, uh, a little bit different than uh, my partners who will be talking after me. I, I don't have a specific uh, uh, joint replacement that I'm going to be uh, informing you about. Mostly what I wanted to do is to uh, echo what uh, Sean has said and uh, hope that uh, you know, you will hear individual talks on different types of joint replacements, knee replacements, shoulder replacements, hip replacements uh, from uh, my four partners. But uh, I would hope that you leave uh, tonight, uh, not that you've seen four individual surgeons that each do uh, a certain type of joint replacement. Um, when uh, Dr. Uh, Troyer, Dr. Hammerly and I uh, came over and joined uh, Dr. Banovitz, uh, Dr. Hennigan, and Dr. Goose uh, about a year and a half ago. One of the first things we did, uh, the folks of us that do joint replacements, we sat down all together and said, all right, how can we make sure that we are uh, providing a service to the people in our community that need it and giving them a fairly uniform experience? And so we sat down and we hashed out, all right, this is the way I do it, this is the way I do it. And uh, we tried to come together uh, as much as we could with consensus, but consensus based on what in the medical uh, field is called best practice. So looking at the literature and saying, all right, uh, what is gonna give our uh, patients the best outcome and then also the most uniform uh, experience that they can have. So hopefully whether you know I do your hip replacement, Dr. Troyer does your shoulder replacement, it's done at St. Michael's Hospital. It's done at the Ambulatory Surgery Center. Uh, the majority of your experience uh, should be uh, fairly uniform and uh, at what we call as best practice. And so it's not uh, five individual surgeons doing different surgeries. It's uh, a uniform uh, joint uh, replacement program that uh, hopefully the folks of you, and I see a few that have gone through it, uh, and some that are uh, just about ready to go through it. Hopefully that's the experience that you come away with. And the other thing that I would like to emphasize uh, with Kevin coming up here and something that I've certainly seen even more so, um, I know, uh, you know the reason you're getting a joint replacement is because it hurts, it hurts when you move. And so a lot of times the last thing you wanna do uh, um, because your joints are hurting or doing some exercises but can't emphasize enough that the uh, patients of mine who uh, are able to do some of the exercises that we ask you to do before the surgery have a dramatically better uh, uh, program, uh, progress after the surgery. So, uh, and sometimes it only needs to be five, 10 minutes a day of doing a few leg lift exercises, uh, a few uh, uh, quad sets we call it. But if you can come in uh, used to doing some exercises your uh, recovery afterward is dramatic, uh, dramatically better. And I'm gonna try to set the stage uh, here and set the uh, tone for trying to keep things short. And so that's all I'm gonna have to say for you to, to, today. Uh, although Sean is telling me that... Uh, um, so I, I did mention briefly that, uh, again, whether your surgery is done at the hospital or done at the ambulatory surgery, uh, center. Um, we expect uh, and hope that you have the same uh, experience. Here's a few pictures of our ambulatory surgery center. Um, just recently, uh, Medicare has approved that uh, total knee replacements on uh, patients who have uh, Medicare can be done at a surgery center, and I think we've done a, a few there now. Um, certainly, there are some patients that uh, still. Uh, clearly require uh, a hospital uh, stay, and we're fortunate to have uh, uh, excellent uh, op options for that for those of you who still need a hospital stay. But uh, again, I'll try to keep things short, and I see Dr. Hennigan uh, saw his picture, and he's uh, working his way towards the front, and he's going to give you a talk about uh, partial knee replacements. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Williams. Can you guys hear me? 
Good. Um, okay, my the side slide up there says Oxford partial knee replacement, but that's actually not what my talk is going to be on. Um, it's just partial knee replacements. There are multiple kinds of partial knee replacements out there. I happen to do the Oxford, but that's not the only good one out there. And so my the slideshow will have the word Oxford on it a whole lot, and I'll actually talk to you a little bit about that. But Pretty much everything I say also applies to the other uni compartmental knee arthroplasties that are out there. Okay. Is that? Does that? No. They get the nice ring holes. Oops. Okay. Well, hey there, that works. Dr. Um, Hammerley also uses a Zimmer product, but it's a different product, but everything I say is going to apply to that too. Um, the knee is a very complex joint. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that much detail as far as how complex it is. Um, that will probably be covered in the next talk. But um, arthritis is damage to the, ar damage to the articular cartilage which is the cartilage that makes up the surfaces of the joint that rub together. Um, there are, how can you recognize it? It hurts. And how can we treat it? Well, that's the topic of what you're here tonight. Um, so I'm also, by the way, going to emulate Dr. Williams and keep my talk a little bit brief because I kind of have a smaller talk than some of the people that are going to be following me. But um, what are your options for um, a knee replacement. Obviously there are, when you have an arthritic joint, there are a lot of things you can do. A lot of them involve uh, exercise, as Dr. Williams was saying, um, anti-inflammatory medications, cortisone injections, there's some lubricants that we inject into the knee on occasion, and then there's surgery, partial and total knee replacements. I am discussing tonight partial knee replacements, although you know, I do more total knee replacements than I do partial knee replacements, but, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so what are your options? What are the benefits? The benefits, uh, of course, you're, you're seeing us because you want to get rid of the pain. Um, and we're not going to really talk about the Oxford partial knee specifically. Um, some, some basic anatomy pictures. The femur is the bone up on the top. The tibia is a bone on the bottom, and the patella, or the kneecap, is a bone up in front. Um, the, these are just different, different names for the, for the same bones. Um, the articular cartilage, which is the stuff that is kind of a bluish white on that picture, is what is worn out um, in arthritis. This intermittently just decides to take a vacation. Sorry about that. Um, but what the what the articular cartilage does is it's an incredibly firm but slippery substance, and that's why um, when you're a teenager, your your joints work so well they move slippery, and you really never notice any any uh, any friction and that sort of thing. Well, and when you get to our age, they tend to wear out. Um, and, uh, and then there's the meniscus, which is that, um, these C-shaped pieces of cartilage right there. Um, those also are part of the knee. They provide some additional mechanical support and, uh, and they transfer some weight between the bones. Um, this is a more important slide right here because the articular cartilage is that stuff right there and they really kind of left it out of the picture on the tibia, but it's that smooth white stuff, that's the stuff that's worn out. And the anterior cruciate ligament is this thing right there. That's actually pretty important in my talk. Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. The anterior cruciate ligament ends up providing a tremendous amount of mechanical support that you need when you're doing a partial knee replacement. When you're doing a total knee replacement, you don't need that. As a matter of fact, we routinely take it out for a total knee replacement, but it's one of the criteria that you absolutely need if you're gonna have a partial knee replacement work. 
Um, so the ligaments are the anterior cruciate ligament, which is that one right in the middle, posterior cruciate ligament, which is in the back, medial collateral ligament uh, is over here, and then the lateral collateral ligament is there. Um, they didn't label those all that well, but that's okay. Um, in the partial knee replacement, one of the big advantages is that we leave all of the ligaments alone. Uh, and that's important because, number one, the implant needs it for the mechanical stability, but also those ligaments have um, little things buried within them that provide what's called proprioception, which is how your body knows where your knee is in space. And so basically, it feels more normal if you can leave all of those things alone. So one of the big advantages of the partial knee is we leave those ligaments alone. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why people tend to do better after the partial knee replacement in certain ways. Um, what is knee arthritis? Inflammation of the, of the joint and breakdown of the articular cartilage. Now there are, this talk is directed at osteoarthritis, which is a breakdown of the, of the articular cartilage. Um, there are other forms of arthritis called rheumatoid arthritis and related things, and the partial knee replacement doesn't work well in those. This is just for osteoarthritis. Um, a huge number of uh, adults suffers from osteoarthritis, and it's the number one uh, cause of disability in the United States. So we discussed this already. Rheumatoid arthritis is an uh, body-wide condition that causes diffuse inflammation and it's, it actually will eat away at your articular cartilage. So you, you'd want to go with a total knee replacement for, for rheumatoid arthritis because the partial won't work. Um, osteoarthritis is the one we're talking about. Horrible picture, but it's where you get uh, um, where you get damage to the uh, to, to the articular cartilage and you get bone on bone articulation. This is a little better picture. Um, the normal knee on the left, you can see all of the smooth, glistening white cartilage. Uh, then the medial compartment osteoarthritis is where you get damage selectively on the medial or inner side, and then tricompartmental is when you get um, medial and lateral involvement, and usually the kneecap is involved in that too. Um, the partial knee replacement is for just medial compartment disease. Uh, symptoms, knee pain, stiff knee. I'm going to fly through some of these because you guys are living it. You don't need me to tell you what all of the symptoms are. Um, Obviously, we ask a lot of things, current health, medications, um, whether there are any coexisting problems that we need to know about. A big one is the range of motion. We watch you walk, uh, see if you have joint line tenderness. Um, X-rays are really critical for this. Um, and because uh, if you have Medial compartment osteoarthritis, there are definitely clues on the x-rays that will tell you tell us whether this is just one compartment or whether this is all three compartments. And so um, that's a normal x-ray, and that's an x-ray that involves medial compartment disease. Uh, so you can see that the lateral compartment over here is fairly normal, good space between the bones here, uh, but on this side, that's bone on bone uh, rubbing. Uh, treatments involve activity modification, as we talked about, weight loss, you know, you can walk with a cane, um, physical therapy, which Dr. Williams talked about, is very important to both to try to prevent the need for knee replacement and also if someone is going to have the knee replacement, partial or total, it's really critical to strengthen the knee as much as possible. Obviously, over-the-counter pain medications, such as naproxen, ibuprofen, uh, and then we get into surgery, uh, joint replacement surgery. Um, when to consider knee replacement, um, diminished quality of life is really the biggest one. If you get to the point where you say, I can't live with this anymore, 
it's worth it to me to undergo the risks of having surgery, that's when we do the surgery. And I can speak with, for pretty much all my partners, I never talk people into having surgery. People come in, tell me it's time to have the surgery, and that's, that's when you know it's time. Um, the goal is, of course, to get rid of the pain and, reduce, and increase your quality of life. Um, and then we get into the traditional total knee replacement or the partial knee replacement. Um, a little history for you, partial knee replacements have actually been around longer than total knee replacements. If you go back to the 70s, um, since most people have involvement mostly on the medial side of the knee, the original people that decided to try to do joint replacements decided to just do the partial knee replacement. But the first several generations of them were terrible. They didn't work well, they loosened, they loosened very quickly, they, uh, they didn't provide good pain relief. And so very shortly, after just a few years, they came up with uh, the, um, the total knee replacement. And we're still using a variation on that total knee replacement today. And Dr. Hammerly will be telling you a lot about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, now, meanwhile, over here in the States, so we we're doing all of these things, the McKeevers, the Macintoshes, all the things that didn't work. But over in England, there was a group of people in Oxford, England, who developed an entirely different sort of implant. Um, and uh, it used completely different concepts. It, rather than just sawing off a piece of bone and putting a piece of metal in, in plastic, they actually used ligament balancing. and. Uh, and they, they've been doing this implant in an essentially an unchanged form since like 1979. So there's extremely long follow-up on this because in England, they have a joint registry, so every implant that's ever gone in there, they have records of. And so they, they can look at 40-year follow-ups on these things. We don't have anything in the States to compare with that, but they were getting amazingly good results that no one else in the United States could uh, could match by coming up with this implant. And so that's a picture of that particular implant. Um, and so um, subsequently, the little digression here, there was a, a fun thing that when, this had been going since the 70s in England, but when they came to the United States to get it through the FDA so that we, they could market it here. So this was in the early 2000s. The first few studies, they would just have American surgeons put it in and the results were terrible. And, uh, and so they went back, the FDA went back to them and said, no, we, the American surgeons cannot reproduce this. And so then they had some American surgeons go to England and learn how to do the surgery correctly from the British surgeons and all of a sudden they came back and then their results were just as good as the British surgeons. So the FDA gave them a conditional acceptance saying, yeah, you can go ahead and market it, but the surgeons that you have doing this have to be trained by the British people. And so, so that's, I, I actually got my training done in Chicago, but from Dr. Goodfellow and some of his associates who were some of the ones that originally came up with the surgery. But, you know, the, the American results are now as good as the historical British results have been. Um, but so the partial knee replacement, since the damage is only on the medial side, it replaces only the medial side of the knee and leaves all the ligaments intact. Um, the, um, this particular implant has... Three Two. Um, the other implant that we're doing locally uh, has a different shape of the of the femur, and then the plastic piece is bonded onto the metal piece. But it's, it's very similar in many ways. But they both work on the whole ligament balancing thing, which, if you really care about, I can talk to you in the back table after we're done. But they're a very good implant. Um, and so here's a compare and contrast. The partial knee, only the damaged portion of the knee is replaced. You keep all your ligaments, smaller incisions, and the biggest thing is it's a much quicker recovery. Um, it, with a traditional total knee, it's a bigger surgery, you resect more bone, you cut out the ACL and PCL. Sometimes the PCL, yes, and sometimes no, that's a whole, Dr. Hammerly will probably talk about that. 
Um, but you know, it's a it's a very good operation, but it's a slower recovery. Um, and so that's just another picture of the same thing we've been talking about: partial knee, partial knee replacement on the, your left, total knee replacement on the right. Um, yeah, we already talked about that. Faster recovery. We pretty much all of these that we do, we do as outpatients. You come in and go home the same day. Usually, you're home four or five hours after the surgery is done. Um, and the the key with this one is that when people do well with the partial knee replacements, they actually do better than people do with the total knee replacements. The what's called the Oxford knee scores and their activity levels are actually quite a bit better with the partial than they are with the total. But there's no free lunch because there is a higher rate of needing to be revised because they fail early on than in a total knee. That's a little complicated, but suffice it to say, it's um, in the people that it works on, it works very well, which is 90% or better of the people. And people are very happy to have this for the most part. But some of them do fail if they have an anterior cruciate ligament injury or if they have some lateral compartment disease that we don't recognize. Don't worry about remembering that. It's, it's a good operation for if you're a candidate. Um, and for many years, we were since the first few generations of this were really not very good, we taught that it's a pre-total knee. We would do this to buy a few years before we did the total knee. But as they, as they look at 20 and 30 year results, they realize that in the people who make it past about 10 years, the people are actually doing better with this than they are with the total knee. So in the vast majority of people, it is the definitive operation. So um, that's it. Um, there will be lots and lots of time for questions later on if we all do our job and, and keep our presentations fairly short. Um, I'm gonna turn you over to Dr. Hammerly here, who's looks suspiciously like the guy that they put in this picture. Um, the, the nice thing about Dr. Hammerly is he can also give a lot of perspective because like me, he does both partial knee replacements and total knee replacements, and he does the, uh, the other kind of total knee re or, uh, partial knee replacement, which is very, very good. But here's Dr. Hammerly. Thank you, Dr. Hennigan. Um, so, uh, as Dr. Hennigan said, my name is Marcus Hammerly. I'm here to talk about total knee replacements, and uh, so we'll get started. So, we'll we're gonna get to we're gonna be able to skip through uh, some of the anatomy indications because obviously it's been gone over uh, previously here already. Um, but that's a little bit of what we're gonna talk about, and so it's the same anatomy as uh, Dr. Hennigan had discussed with the partial knee. And uh, when that cartilage on the ends of the bone breaks down, and when it breaks down globally, and not just in one compartment, uh, then that's when we uh, start discussing total knee replacements. So arthritis is a very common condition, and so total knee replacements ends up being a very common condition. Um, get through some of that stuff again. And again, the symptoms are things that many of us in the room uh, can relate to, but activity-related pain, uh, pain that is beginning to limit our ability to stand and walk for uh, uh, any given length of time, and then a lot of folks will talk about having pain when they are first getting up from a seated position, um, and a lot of swelling, stiffness, and achiness at night. So this is an x-ray of a normal knee on the left uh, with an arthritic knee on the right, and so, the, the normal knee has nice smooth bony contours, has a space in between the femur bone and the tibia bone. That space is where the cartilage is and because cartilage is not calcified, it uh, does not show up on an x-ray so it looks like a blank space. We can see on the x-ray on the right that that space is essentially gone here. So that means that cartilage is all worn out, the bones are getting awfully close together. You could call that bone on bone arthritis. And then you can see that the bone changes, so it's not so smooth on the sides. It gets bumps there, uh, bone spurs that develop uh, due to the arthritis. So the treatment options, again, you can try to manage the symptoms of the arthritis non-surgically. Uh, none of those options will eliminate the arthritis. They only are trying to reduce uh, the pain and symptoms, uh, but they are limited. And when those symptoms, uh, I'm sorry, when those treatments uh, are not effective, 
then uh, surgery becomes an option. So Dr. Hannigan gave you the history of knee replacements, uh, and uh, again, it's been around for a number of decades. It's been re refined over the years. Um, it's a very common surgery because knee arthritis is so common, and because we are living longer and more active and healthier lives, um, our knees tend to wear out faster than the rest of us for, for many people. And what the knee replacement does is it creates a new surface, so that cartilage surface is all worn out, and so then uh, we replace it with the metal and plastic components. And again, that's what these components are made of. So just like with the partial knee, you have a metal component on the femur uh, and a metal component uh, typically on the tibia with a plastic uh, piece that can uh, are, uh, hook into that, uh, that metal piece on the tibia. This uh, picture does not show the kneecap, but another difference between the partial knee and the total knee is that we, at least in North America, typically will resurface the uh, kneecap as well. And, and that's how I like to describe it. It's a resurfacing of the bones. It's not a replacement of those bones, even though we call it a total knee replacement. Well, we're not replacing um, large chunks of the bones. We're just replacing the surfaces because those are the parts that are worn out. So uh, again, with that decision-making, when, when you as the patient gets to, get to a point where uh, the pain is becoming functionally limiting, and it's getting in the way of things that you like to do or want to do, uh, and the non-surgical treatment options are failing you, uh, then that's when a knee replacement is, is an option. Um, and, then, and then that last night, you know, preferably, uh, you know, you've probably been told that we like to wait until we're older before we think about doing a knee replacement. And the reason we want to do that is uh, these artificial parts have a lifespan to themselves too, and the goal uh, every time we do this is that, you know, we hope that this is the last surgery that that knee is ever going to need, and that this will last you the rest of your life. Now, the younger we are, when we have it done, obviously the risk of it um, having it being redone uh, goes up. And so these tend to be fairly successful procedures. Uh, most people are very satisfied with the results. <laughs> Uh, and most of them uh, last us at least 15 to 20 years. Uh, now there are a lot of variables that go into that, uh, but, but that's, uh, you know, for people that have a debilitating condition like knee arthritis, uh, it's, it's helpful to get that longevity. So there are a handful of risks, just like there are with any surgery, um, and most of these are not unique to knee replacements other than the last one where, again, eventually these parts can wear out uh, uh, if, uh, if we give them enough time. And so we attempt to reduce those risks. Uh, you know, we know those risks are there, so we do a handful of things to help reduce those risks. Most people are placed on a blood thinner with the trend nowadays being a simple aspirin taken once a day. Um, we do a lot of steps. We have a protocol in place to reduce the risk of infection. An infection after a surgery can be a, a devastating complication, but particularly when we have artificial parts in there. Uh, and so we take every, uh, every measure that we uh, can to reduce the risk of that happening. Um, getting patients moving early and doing physical therapy also helps to reduce risks. That early movement has really helped. And then there are a lot of things that you as the patient can do to reduce the risk, and that's controlling our weight proper nutrition prior to surgery, if we have diabetes, having that diabetes under good, tight control. And if we smoke, uh, we, we want to stop smoking before we have surgery. And that helps to reduce all those risks that were on that list. So prior to surgery, what to expect? Uh, certainly you're going to meet with Sean, and you got to meet her tonight. And uh, she is our joint coordinator, and she helps to uh, be a resource to provide you information about what to expect. Uh, and then she gets to know you and you get to know her and so that uh, she's uh, there with us every step of the, of the process to help make sure that it goes smooth. Uh, all patients need to have a preoperative physical by their primary care provider. We, uh, we get culture uh, uh, you for a certain bacteria to see if we need to preemptively treat you before we have surgery to help reduce the risk of infection. And then the exercises that uh, were mentioned earlier as well. The anesthetic options, uh, it's either a spinal anesthetic with sedation or a general anesthetic with or without 
um, uh, a nerve block to help numb up the knee. The procedure itself, on average, depending on uh, who's doing it or how difficult the knee might be, uh, would take about an hour and a half for most of us. Uh, the skin incision is right uh, down the midline of the knee. And then as we get into the deeper structures, we have to go around the kneecap to get into the knee joint itself. Once we get into that knee, we have special cutting guides. And you know, so again, patients ask me, well, how, how are you making these cuts? You know, again, are you gonna cut my femur off halfway and the tibia uh, the other halfway? It's, it's just the surfaces that we're cutting. And so we have special cutting guides that uh, we can apply to that knee. Uh, while we're doing the surgery that help to line up our cuts and measure those cuts uh, to, to take just the right amount of bone off and so that it's in line with the, with the, uh, with the bone itself. And then once we've made those cuts, then we, then we can size the bones. And so we're all uh, built with different shapes and sizes. And so we have sizing guides that we then use that tell us what size that uh, femur is and what size that tibia is and then once we've done that, we have um, uh, a pan full of trial parts, right? So we've got trial parts for the femur, trial parts for the tibia, and then the plastic that, that, plastic that goes in between. And, and they're color coded to help us uh, make sure we're putting uh, the, the parts that are compatible with each other. Um, and then we test it out. We say, okay, how's that feel? Is that knee moving the way I want that knee to move when I'm all done? Uh, does it have full range of motion? And is it stable? Is it is it uh, not wobbly on me when I'm when I'm stressing it side to side? And then once we're happy with those parts, we say, okay, this is the size I want. This is uh, the size of the plastic I need. Uh, then we then implant the final components, and uh, and typically those are cemented to the bone. Um, and then once we've done that, we do our final check of our range of motion and our stability. Make sure we're uh, all happy with it and then we uh, close up the, the deep layer and the skin. And so this is what we'd like it to look like when it's all done. So this is the x-ray looking at the knee from the front and then looking at it from the side. And, uh, and so you can see the metal very well on x-ray. You cannot see the plastic, but you can make out a little shadow here and there's plastic in between those metal parts. Um, and there's the, the kneecap component, there's plastic, there's a sort of a plastic dome that uh, gets cemented to the underside of the kneecap. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this. This is uh, something uh, the, the company that I use that does knee replacements and, and other companies have this as well, uh, where patients may want, they may say, I want a custom knee. Well, this isn't necessarily a custom knee, but what this is is a, a, a custom guide for that knee that we can do preoperatively and have, man, have manufactured uh, to help uh, during the surgery. And so what this is, is uh, we get an MRI of that entire leg and that helps to give us a 3D computer model of that knee and also gives us the alignment of that leg. And then, uh, I'll back up there, sorry. Uh, and then we use that tool. I use that tool to, to decide where I want my cuts to be and it also tells me what size that femur is and what size that tibia is. Um, and then the company will then manufacture special guides that will then uh, uh, guide my cuts so that I can use those during surgery. Uh, there's, there has not been data to show that that improves outcomes, but what I think that it does improve is it shortens my surgical time because I know what size you are and also uh, I don't need the, the, uh, the cutting guides uh, to be lined up because it's already made for me. Um, and, I, and it also helps to reduce a little bit of that blood loss. So it cuts down a little bit of the surgical time, a little bit of the blood loss, it does add a bit of the cost to the surgery, and it does take a little bit more time to prepare for it. And so this is what the um, computer model would look like. This is what I would get uh, sent to me, and then I can play with that model on the computer to determine where I want my cuts, and then again, tells me what size the components are gonna be. All right, and so then back to kind of in general, uh, people wanna know what's gonna, done, what's gonna be done to help with my pain, and so there, there's been a lot of advances over the years to help reduce the pain from the surgery. It is not a pain-free operation, that's for sure. Uh, but we do uh, better now than we did in the past. We, we preemptively treat people with pain uh, pills just prior to surgery. We can use a regional anesthetic, like a nerve block beforehand, and then all of us will inject uh, 
uh, usually a cocktail of pain medicine into the knee during the surgery and all that helps to reduce that pain uh, right after surgery. Um, we also give a medication that will limit the bleeding to the knee, which will help reduce the swelling, which also helps to reduce the pain. And then, uh, and then the typical sort of medications that may be uh, used afterwards. So uh, after surgery, uh, the other thing that has improved over time is the, the, the length of stay has definitely shortened over the last five to 10 years. And so patients that are done in the hospital typically stay overnight and are ready to go home the next day. And then patients that are done at our ambulatory surgery center go home uh, typically the afternoon of the surgery. Uh, and that's been allowed because our protocols have been improved to reduce that pain and to help accelerate their uh, recovery. And we find that it is preferable for patients to be able to recover at home, uh, sleep in their own bed, uh, be with their family, as opposed to uh, having to stay in the hospital and all the, all the noises and distractions there. Um, other things to expect, expect early physical therapy. So we get you up walking early, we get the knee moving early. Your follow-up appointments typically are around two or three weeks after the surgery and then uh, a, month and, uh, a month or two after that to uh, make sure that we're recovering, we're recovering appropriately. So therapy is done to emphasize that range of motion, uh, regain strength and return to function and I don't have it up here, but they'll also help with the pain and the swelling early on. Typically, we can allow you to weight bear fully on that knee right from the get-go, but we need to use an assisted device early on to support that leg, and so it's typically a walker for a couple of weeks, and then a cane for a few weeks after that. The swelling and the bruising and the stiffness start to turn the corner and get better after a few weeks, and then gradually improve week by week after that. And I expect most patients to tell me after about two or three months that they're very functional and maybe they're doing even better than they were prior to surgery. Um, but we'll expect them to continue to see improvements even up to a year afterwards. So there's Dan, he's here. He's one of our physical therapists. And next up is gonna be Dr. Goose. So um, hopefully that was helpful to answer some of your questions about knee replacements. Again, all of us here, with the exception of Dr. Troyer, do total knee replacements, and so feel free to come up and uh, talk with us afterwards. We'd be happy to uh, fill you in on anything else that you had questions about. All right, I think Dan Burrow, our physical therapist, is actually gonna cut in uh, and uh, talk briefly about the uh, physical therapy side. That's why your picture was here. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? No. Hello. no. How about now? Yeah. Well, my name is Dan Burrow. I'm a physical therapist. I graduated from the prestigious Marquis de Sade School of Physical Therapy in 2009. Uh, go sadists. With a major in physical pain, a minor in displeasure, and a doctorate in medieval torture methods. I graduated with top marks. Thank you for the applause. I've been able to hone my skills to a very high level over the past decade and look forward to working with you for your next joint replacement. But in all seriousness, my name is Dan Burrow. I'm a physical therapist, and it's a pleasure to be here. I won't be keeping you long. Um, I only want to talk about one thing, but in fact, this is a very important thing. It is the most important thing to a successful recovery following a joint replacement. And I'm gonna tell you the secret. How do I know it's the most important thing? Because people like you have told me. When people are finished with their rehab, I like to ask them, what's the number one thing that helped you get through this surgery? Or if you could give advice to a person that's thinking about having this surgery, what would it be? And they always say the same thing. Take your oxycodone. No, 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 that's, that's not right. The number one answer is truly do your exercises. Now, of course you'd expect a physical therapist to say this to you, and perhaps it's only because I have their knee in a full Nelson, but this is the number one answer. 
So some people have realized this because they didn't do their exercises and they paid for it with more pain or a longer recovery. But most people listened to this advice and did their exercises and avoided these problems. The reason the exercises are so important is because your body heals quickly, almost too quickly. See, it mends itself with one of its toughest proteins called collagen. And collagen is found in the body in places where it doesn't want tearing to occur, such as tendons, ligaments, skin, and especially scar tissue. So scar tissue forms very rapidly after a major surgery like joint replacement, and it can lead to problems. Um, it can make your joint very stiff, tight, painful. So immediately after surgery, the temptation is to not move because it can be scary. Um, it can also can be painful or there might be swelling or perhaps you're just too tired or you feel uneasy. But if you rest and if you don't move too long, you'll only be causing more pain and a longer recovery. So the patients that move their joints right away tend to have a faster recovery and less pain. So now you know the secret and after you have your surgery and when you don't want to do your exercises, I want you to see this face and I want you to do those exercises. And to get you started, we prepared some exercises to do before your surgery, um, as Dr. Williams has already mentioned, um, that doing your exercises before surgery will help you get prepared and have a, a faster recovery. So we've prepared some exercises for you. They're on the back table um, for hip, knee, and shoulder. Those are some pretty basic exercises. You should be able to start them right away, and they shouldn't cause a lot of pain. Um, but I should mention that these are preoperative exercises, especially for the shoulder. There's, if you've had, uh, or if you're having a shoulder replacement, um, you'll have a different set of exercises afterwards, and some of those exercises might actually not be the right ones for you. So these are pre-surgical um, exercises only. All right, thank you very much. Next up, Dr. Goobs. I'm uh, Dr. Thomas Goose. I came to talk to you about uh, hip replacement. Some of this will uh, kind of overlap with what's been said, so you can maybe go through this kind of quickly. So the hip is a, uh, it's a ball and socket joint. I don't know how I can see the pointer, but uh, so you see the acetabulum is a socket, the femoral head is the ball. In addition, there's the uh, capsule uh, ligaments that help hold these two bones together. So as far as uh, hip replacement goes, what are the causes of pain? The most common far and away is osteoarthritis, the kind of standard wear and tear arthritis kind of wears out over time. Rheumatoid arthritis is the immune response that attacks the joints. Uh, in a fracture, a lot of times, if you fracture just the top of the ball, we can replace just that ball, which is a half of a replacement. Avascular necrosis is uh, seen in hips not uncommonly. It's a loss of blood supply to the femur, to the ball. Um, it occurs in uh, people on certain medicines, certain steroids can cause it. Uh, Scuba divers, if you've ever been scuba diving, they tell you when you come up, you gotta come up slowly because going up fast, that's what it's gonna do, it cause you lose the blood supply to the hip. Um, heavy drinkers, a lot of times will get that. And then there are people with childhood hip diseases. There's things like perthes, which is a uh, disease of the bones of the hip. And some people are just born with a poorly shaped hip if you have what's called dysplasia. You don't have a well-formed hip, you get a lot of wear in a small area, which causes more problems. This is kind of goes with the first picture, osteoarthritis, but now you no longer see that nice smooth surface anymore. It's rough, the cartilage is basically worn away. You get so basically bone on bone, so this bone is rubbing on that bone, you don't have that nice smooth cushion anymore. And now this is just got an x-ray that kind of goes with that. 
again, you can't see the cartilage. The cartilage is the surface between the ball and the socket. Over here, there's nothing left anymore. It's just bone on bone. That's why it's rough. That's why it won't move well. That's why you have all the pain. So when to have surgery, again, it's pretty much like a knee. You do the simple things. You try and make it better that way when those things never work anymore, when they're not helping, when you can't get around to do things you need to do, that's when you talk about having a hip replacement. We don't want you sitting in a chair all day doing nothing in pain if you just because your hip hurts. But the basic measures are the over the medicines, the ibuprofen, acetaminophen, naproxen. Ice and heat can help. There are a lot of different creams and ointments out there. There are over the counter medicines, over the counter ointments, there are prescription ointments. They come in patches, which is really the same medicine, it's just in a patch form. It keeps everything in one small area, it keeps your clothes, clothes clean as nice. Those work better in knees and probably in shoulders. Your hip joint is actually very deep inside. It's unlikely anything, any ointments you put on your skin or in a patch are actually going to penetrate all the way down to your hip joint. But there are people out there who use them. They say it makes them happy, makes them feel better. So if it makes you feel better, it's not a problem. Physical therapy, again, if you work on physical therapy, if you're just having pain, it usually does help some of the pain. It's not likely to limit all your pain if you got hip arthritis. But it certainly can make you get around better. You've got motion, better strength, so you can do more things. Um, cortisone injections, we can do cortisone injections for a hip, just like you can for a knee. It's more involved. You usually need an ultrasound machine or you can do it with a special x-ray machine in the hospital. <laughs> cortisone injections are temporary, they make things feel better, they are uh, not going to solve the problem, you get a shot of cortisone, the x-ray is not going to look any better. Um, eventually it wears off. If you do have a shot of cortisone and it doesn't work well for you, for any joint, you can't have a joint replacement then for a minimum of three months because the risk of infection goes up. Um, and a cane for, for hip arthritis, canes and walkers can work well, they do some walking supports. If you can use a cane for hip arthritis, you usually use the cane on the opposite side of where the arthritis is, but it takes the strain off the joint, so that can help with the pain, can help you get around and do more. But again, when, it's when those things don't work anymore, you talk about having surgery, just kind of goes through some of these things. This is a, a diagram of one type of hip replacement. There are a whole lot of different designs. They, of course, come in a lot of different sizes, so they can fit anyone. But uh, you generally have a metal shell here that gets pounded into the socket or acetabulum. There's a liner. This is a plastic liner, and that's largely what you use. The liners can be made out of metal sometimes, so you can have a metal on metal hip, kind of going away from some of those. It can be ceramic. The stem here is generally metal. The ball can be either metal or ceramic as well. Then the whole thing can either be cemented in, or it can be what's called the ingrowth where the bone will grow into the surfaces. This is kind of a picture to kind of show you the back of a shell, one of the acetabulums. On the back side, you got all these little uh, gaps and inner spaces that bone will grow into over time. There's also a lot of screw holes, so you can pound that in. You can add supplemental fixation with screws to fix that. You put it in, and when you put it in, you want it to be solidly fixed right away between putting it in tight and then putting in the screws. But uh, over a period of a few months, bone will grow in as well. That helps fix that. And then the plastic shell, just looking at it from this direction, will snap into that metal shell. So just kind of going over the procedure briefly. So there are, the bone doesn't show up real great on this one on, the, uh, on your right side. The bone has muscle attachments throughout the area. So we try and leave all the bone where the main muscle attachments are and just resect the top of the ball here and then on the uh, cup side what you do is you take some acetabular some hemispherical reamers and you ream out this rough beat up area to a nice smooth shell and then you take an appropriate size metal shell or you could actually cement in a plastic shell occasionally as well you pound that in and then if you need to you can add supplemental screws then you snap in the plastic liner typically into that shell. Then on the femoral side, on the stem side, the solid bone here is on the outside and you got the soft bone down the middle. So we remove the soft bone in the middle of the femur, leave all the hard bone, and you get that to an appropriate size and then you put in this metal stem that's appropriately sized. 
you pound that in, and then again, that can be cemented in as well. And then the uh, head, again, could be metal or ceramic, but they come in different sizes, different lengths, so you can adjust somebody's leg length that way at that time to try and get it appropriate. Um, surgery, again, like a knee, takes probably about an hour and a half. And uh, anesthesia is either spinal or general. <clears throat> Some of the controversies about uh, hip replacements, inpatient or outpatient, again, just like a knee replacement, it can be done as an outpatient, though if you have Medicare, it cannot. Medicare this year approved knees to be done as outpatients. There are suggestions that next year they'd approve hips to be done as outpatients, but they have not as of yet. If you have private insurance, you can have it done as an outpatient. To have it done as an outpatient, though, you gotta be healthy. Um, some of the advantages are it's a lot cheaper to have it done as an outpatient. You're also not in the hospital with all the other sick people who got their coronavirus or whatever. <laughs> so, other ones, you, you can have a uh, cemented stem and shell or you can have an ingrowth again. It kind of depends on the quality of your bone. Some people are a little sicker with uh, weaker bones we tend to go more towards cement. We use ingrowth in the majority of situations. Uh, metal on metal was popular for a while. Hit the wrong button here. It was popular for a while. We're kind of fading away. There's some problems with that, but it still is done sometimes rather than doing the plastic pieces or the ceramic pieces. Uh, hip resurfacing is another one. It's a type of metal on metal replacement. You don't actually replace the whole stem though. You actually put where you resurface the socket with just a shell, you actually put a shell on the top of the femur. And the thought was, well, if you do a minimal operation like that, people go back to running and jumping and playing all these sports. <clears throat> it hasn't really worked out as well as we had hoped on some of these things, so it's fading a little bit, but there are still people doing some of those. Uh, mini, mini incisions, another thing that was popular for a while. You can sometimes make one real little incision or sometimes two little incisions where they make one little incision to put the cup in and one to put the stem in. Um, again, there are some problems with that. It's a little harder to do the operation well when you're working through a tiny little incision, but there's still some people doing those. <clears throat> and uh, I mentioned before, partial lip replacement. If you have, if you break your hip, it's pretty common to, if you need to replace that to just do the broken part, you just replace that part that's broken. Some people, some people with what's called avascular necrosis where the bone dies and if the rest of the hip's in good shape, you can talk about doing a partial replacement but then you have the, uh, the cartilage on the uh, socket side that can wear out over time if you're walking on that with metal. So there are risks with that as well. Um, so one of the big things people talk about today, one of the big uh, controversies is uh, which approach, which direction should you go for um, in order to do the operation? So the posterior approach is the most common. It's been around the longest, it has good results, um, but you make a, you make a incision of the back of the hip. An anterior approach is a fairly new one. It's been around for a little while. Again, you make an incision in front, the patient lays down flat rather than on their side. The posterior lateral approach has been around for a while. It's uh, been done, again, has good results. The uh, hot new one is the direct superior approach. <clears throat> um, so going back, so the posterior approach, the anterior approach, the posterior lateral approach all have some reasonably long-term results. They all seem to give equally good results. They seem to have similar complication rates. It's probably not a big deal for any of those. The direct superior approach, like I said, is fairly new. Um, there are some short-term results that look to be as good, neither better nor worse than the others, but we don't have long-term results on that one. Again, it's a fairly new one, but, for, but not many people are doing that either. The large majority of people are doing the other three that are common seem to give equally good results. <clears throat> the risks, anytime you have this major operation, there's risks, like with a knee, there's a risk of infection is about 1%. If that happens, it's a big problem. It's occasionally, you go in and just kind of wash it out and give some antibiotics and it'll clear up, but frequently you have to take all the pieces out, get the infection clear up, put the pieces back in. Blood clots are risk. Most people are treated with aspirin. If you have a risk of blood clots, if you've got a history of blood clots or other medical problems that would cause clotting, sometimes we put you on stronger blood thinners, they come in shots or pills. But of course, the stronger blood thinners, you get more risk of bleeding. Uh, general medical problems, you have trouble with the uh, heart, lungs, kidneys. That's why you gotta see your family doctor ahead of time, make sure you're healthy enough to go ahead. With hip, leg length inequality is always risk. So you, you cut out the pieces, you cut out the, 
the ball and the stem and you, you do everything and then you put new pieces in and you try and get them to be the appropriate length. It's not uncommon to be off by a couple millimeters here or there. It's unusual to be off by a lot, but it's always a risk is that it could be off. When you just had a big operation, as right afterwards, a lot of times it's just harder to clear your hip when you walk, it's harder work, and sometimes it will state that the leg feels longer, even though the leg lengths are the same, just because you're working harder to get your leg moving. That does obviously get better with time. One of the general risks of any joint replacement is loosening and wear. Things can wear out over time. Certainly we hope to get 20 years or so out of a hip replacement. The way joint replacement replacements work, unfortunately, is that uh, younger, healthier people, if you have a down when you're 45 and you're still working and doing a lot, it's probably not gonna last as long as if you have a down when you're 75 and not moving around nearly as much because it's activity that can cause things to wear out over time. Um, fractures a risk. That can happen during surgery when you're putting things in, things can break, or afterwards. If you fall after you've had hip replacement, the, the metal pieces don't break generally. It's just the bones around that. Occasionally you can break the socket, the acetabulum. More often what happens is it breaks. If you go back at the tip of the, the femur, kind of down in here is where it tends to break because that's usually the weak spot. If you fall and break your leg after you've had a hip replacement, and that can be fixed, but it's a, it's a big operation again. One of the other risks with the hip is dislocation. So, like I pointed out at the beginning, there's that uh, capsule, those ligaments that hold the ball and socket together. No matter which direction you come from, what approach you use, you have to cut those ligaments to do the surgery to put these pieces in. So, we're relying afterwards, early on, on this ball and socket. If you've got your hip in a reasonable position, the ball is in the socket, you should be fine. But we do repair those ligaments and stuff afterwards, but if you're not cautious, you move the wrong way, you can get the hip to dislocate like this, and you'd know right away, it's painful. Again, that happens a few percent of people, it doesn't happen very often, but you gotta be cautious. The general rule is you don't bend your hip up more than 90 degrees, you don't wanna turn your toes in, you don't cross your legs over, to try and protect it, you want to keep the ball in the socket and it heals up. It can happen any time. I saw a guy in the emergency room not that long ago who had a super place nine years ago in Chicago, never had a problem. And he's, he's actually a truck driver, was unloading something, bent down too far, and he dislocated his hip for the first time ever, nine years out. So it can happen any time. It's one of the risks, so that's why they give you the precautions after surgery. After the surgery, most people get a lot better. The pain should get better. You should get around better. Occasionally, if you're using a walker to begin with, you can go back to a cane or use less support to get around. We let you go back to most things, and this is true for knees as well. You should be able to get back to most daily activities. Most people go back to work and do their job. Most exercise is okay. I probably should have put uh, walking first. Walking is great for exercise after you've had a joint replacement. We do allow you to go back to playing golf, riding a bike, using an elliptical machine. But because the uh, main contributors to wear and tear is just the amount of activity you do, we like to stay away from the, the running and jumping activities after a hip replacement or a knee replacement. Uh, so you know, if, you're, uh, if you're running up and down the basketball court and slamming the ball, we ask you to stop once you're done. So, uh. And uh, otherwise, I think Dr. Troyer's up next here. One, we're almost there. All right, so I'm Dr. Josh Troyer. We're going to talk about shoulder arthritis and shoulder replacements. So, just starting off with a little bit of anatomy. So, the shoulder is made up of, I don't know if the camera guy's mine, but I'm just going to come up here and point because I don't think you can see the laser pointer from way back there. So, your shoulder is a ball and socket joint, just like the hip joint Dr. Goose was just talking about. The ball meets the socket here, and that comes off of the humerus bone or the arm bone, and the socket's off of the scapula bone. <coughs> And nearby is the clavicle as well, your collarbone. So actually the clavicle is the only true attachment of the upper arm to your main skeleton. The rest is all extra muscular attachments. And there's actually 17 muscles attached to and from our shoulder blade. And the shoulder joint, as we said, is a ball and socket joint. It has the most range of motion of any joint in our body. 
Um, unlike the hip joint, the ball is larger than the socket. So this allows great mobility, you can move it, but it sacrifices stability. So Dr. Goose is just talking about hip dislocations. Shoulder is the most common joint to dislocate in our body. So there's a uh, key difference between the two joints there. So this is analogous to a golf ball on a golf tee. And a lot of times in clinic, I'll show people their x-rays and show them uh, the views and say, hey, this looks, looks like the golf ball, and I'll refer to it as the golf ball and as the golf tee. So the ball would be the ball of the socket and the tee would be the socket. So the ligaments of the shoulder are meant to be loose to keep that nice range of motion and they limit the extreme positions of our shoulder joint and they allow for significant movement. Um, muscular attachments of the shoulder, the main muscles that we'll talk about today is the deltoid, which is a bigger muscle on the side of our arm, and the rotator cuff. So everybody hears about the rotator cuff, it's an important group of four muscles and those muscles turn into tendons. You can see here on this picture, this is the front rotator cuff. So the muscle turns to tendon and the tendon inserts on the arm bone. And there's a top tendon, which is actually the most commonly injured one. There's actually two in the back. So these are actually deep, deep, deep down in our shoulder. So those four muscles are the subscapularis, that's the front one, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. So because the shoulder joint is so unstable, uh, we need those rotator cuff muscles to provide stability to our shoulder. So essentially, those rotator cuff models, muscles are the dynamic stabilizers, meaning when our shoulder's moving, that rotator cuff is doing its job to keep that ball centered in the socket. So it just like I said here, so the job of the rotator cuff is to keep the ball centered in the socket, it compresses the ball against the socket and aids in reaching our arm out away from our side and overhead as well. So sometimes we have shoulder pain and different people experience different things. Uh, most people say they have pain at rest or pain with movement. Sometimes people have sharper or stronger pains. Uh, most common reason people come to see me in clinic for shoulder pain is because they can't sleep at night. They get discomfort. As soon as you think that you wouldn't have any pain because you're laying down a good, a good night of rest, all of a sudden that shoulder starts to ache like a toothache. And the type of the pain that you feel and where you feel that might um, tell us what's going on inside your shoulder joint. So <laughs> this is a funny cartoon. I figured I'd add a little humor because they're in the last presentation. So, it's pretty small for you guys, but it says, you say it's a sharp stabbing pain. Hmm, sharp stabbing pain. <laughs> so um, again, the common shoulder uh, symptoms, pain at rest, worsen with reaching and overhead activities, radiating symptoms between the shoulder and the elbow. Sometimes pain can radiate to your neck. Uh, weakness out away from your body, so you just can't, you just don't have that strength you used to have. Having trouble sleeping at night, like we said or limitations in your range of motion, like stiffness. You just you don't have that range of motion you used to have, or mechanical symptoms such as catching or clicking. So these are the most common shoulder diagnoses, and what we'll be talking about tonight is shoulder arthritis. arthritis. The uh, impingement is where um, there's a phenomenon of the rotator cuff getting pinched between the bones that we talked about earlier. There's AC joint, which is a little joint above your shoulder joint, which can get arthritis in it. Um, rotator cuff tendonitis or rotator cuff tears is a super common thing that uh, people come to see us for for shoulder pain. Your biceps tendon is in front of your shoulder and that could be a significant pain generator for people. Frozen shoulder is a condition, um, an autoimmune condition where the shoulder just loses its range of motion. It's exquisitely painful. And then shoulder arthritis. So here's um, imaging. I think again, any talk about the shoulder starts and ends with the rotator cuff. So this is what our rotator cuff is. If you look at this, this is an MRI scan. I know it's a little small for people far away, but here's the arm bone, here's the ball of the ball and socket, and here's the socket on the right. So this is that rotator cuff muscle, and we talked about how the muscle turns to a tendon, and then the tendon inserts in the arm bone. And this is what it looks like through a scope. I don't, it doesn't project very well, but it's that white covering of tendon that covers the whole ball of the ball and socket. And this, would, this is what a problematic rotator cuff would look like. So here's an MRI tear showing a little tear. You can actually see this little bright signal underneath the tendon. The tendon's right here. You can kind of see that. That would be an area where the tendon is not actually healed to the bone. Here's a little bigger tear where the tendon comes over here. You can see it ends right there. And you can see this white fluid signal from the shoulder joint fluid. And so that's a, a full thickness tear. And another similar phenomenon here over here where the rotator cuff's torn. But in real life, I think this is the more interesting picture, is this is what it looks like if the rotator cuff has a tear. So this tear is kind of shaped like the letter V. You can actually see in the ball and socket joint. You should actually not see in there. You should see just white rotator cuff tissue. Here's a bigger U-shaped tear. We can actually see the ball is here, the socket is in here, and that rotator cuff needs to be attached way out over here, and it's not. 
just a few more um, um, images of rotator tear. So an X-ray. A lot of times, when you if you have shoulder pain, you come to see me. We'll get an X-ray. The reason being, you can learn a lot from those X-rays. So earlier on, we talked about how that rotator cuff's job is to keep the ball down in the socket. And one of the things I commonly do in clinic is show patients, hey, here's the top of this person's socket, right here. Here's the top of the ball. If you look at the ball, it's riding up way high in the socket. And then that tells you already that you know that that rotator cuff's not doing its job keeping the ball down in the socket. And here's another kind of um, more mild problem where you kind of just see that there's actually some reaction to the bone. So you can guess that person's probably got a rotator cuff issue. So what we normally do for rotator cuff tears is start with someone like Dan, a really skilled therapist to help get your strength and range of motion back, show you how to kind of move appropriately and exercise to do. We try over-the-counter treatments such as anti-inflammatories or give it some time, try some ice or heat. Um, if those things don't work for your rotator cuff, then sometimes it's necessary to do a rotator cuff surgery repair. So that's the same picture as before from the side, but this is where those sutures come and reattach that tendon to the bone. And then this is the other option, which is a reverse total shoulder replacement. So that's a very special type of shoulder replacement we'll talk about more in just a second. So now on to shoulder arthritis. So shoulder arthritis is fairly common, especially as we get older. It's present up into 32, almost 33% of people over the age of 60. So the pain is caused by the loss of cartilage covering on the end of the bone where the ball meets the socket. So very similar concept to the knee and the hip. Same exact thing where that cartilage coating on the end of the bone wears out. So this picture right here shows normal healthy cartilage inside. This is actually a picture from a scope inside the shoulder joint. This is the socket right here. Here's the ball. You can see that cartilage is smooth, white, polished, almost like a billiard ball. If you look to the picture to the right, this is arthritis in the joint. So you can see now you can see exposed bone, just a little bit of cartilage on the surface, and that's a worn out shoulder joint. Um, arthritis, as we mentioned for the hip and the knee, can be primary, which is what we call kind of good old fashioned wear and tear arthritis, or secondary. So maybe there's some other cause of that arthritis. Maybe you had a break in the shoulder joint or you dislocated when you were younger and have developed uh, arthritis. Uh, it can also be caused by other disease, diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or uh, Dr. Goose is talking about avascular necrosis or AVM. Here's what shoulder arthritis looks like on x-ray. So kind of the hallmarks of arthritis on any x-ray, not just the shoulder, is narrowing of the space between the bones. So here you can see the ball, here's the socket, you can see how close they look. Another common thing you see is bone spurs. So on the shoulder, we call this the billy goat's beard because it kind of looks like a little billy goat's beard and it hangs down from the, the arm bone. Here's another good picture of decreased joint space and bone spurs of the ball and socket joint. This is a, a recent 3D CD, CT scan of one of my patients. So it's a CT scan that throws everything in three dimensions showing arthritis with the large bone spurs. So treatment options for arthritis, your shoulder, and you can honest, honestly apply this to the hip or the knee or anywhere you might have some arthritis. So activity modification, rest, uh, glucosamine, chondroitin, physical therapy, or home exercises, injections, be it um, steroid injections or PRP injections, ice or heat, anti-inflammatories such as Advil or naproxen, Tylenol, creams or ointments like BioFreeze or Icy Hot or um, any of those kind of similar products, massage, acupuncture, chiropractics, laser therapy, those are all things that people try. And if your pain is kind of refractory, it just keeps hurting you no matter what, then shoulder replacement may be an option for you. So um, shoulder replacement is the third most common joint to be replaced. And when it comes to shoulders, a few more options. So we talked about how the knee had that partial knee replacement Dr. Hennigan talked, or, um, yeah, Dr. Hennigan talked about, or a total knee replacement Dr. Hamley talked about. The hip, we kind of talked a little bit about partial replacements. For the shoulder, there's gonna be three different options. So we'll just go through these A, B, and C. So total shoulder replacement, reverse total shoulder replacement, and a partial replacement. We're going to start with the partial replacement because that's by common or by far the least common replacement is done. So this is declining as time goes on. It used to be used more for if you fell and broke your arm bone, that may be something that happens. Now it's more common to get a reverse total shoulder. Another common scenario is if you have AVM, we we're talking about AVMs where actually the blood supply of the bone dies. This is an MRI picture of where that blood supply is dying and that cartilage is dying too. So, um, but partial shoulder replacement or hemiarthroplasty is pretty rare nowadays. It doesn't happen too often. So total shoulder arthroplasty or kind of a conventional shoulder replacement. This is best for younger active patients with arthritis and an intact rotator cuff. Again, every discussion about shoulder replacement is all about the rotator cuff. So that rotator cuff, if you're gonna get a standard shoulder replacement, has to be totally intact. 
So when compared to a partial replacement, and in some studies compared to reverse replacement, you can have better pain relief, but um, this again is uh, dependent on that rotator cuff, which is so important for the outcome of patients with shoulder replacement. Reverse uh, total shoulder replacement is now the most common type of shoulder replacement in the world. It does not rely on the rotator cuff, rather it provides a mechanical advantage to the, the big muscle in the outside arm, your deltoid, and the deltoid then does lifting for your shoulder. So this is a reverse right here. This is actually a picture of Dr. Goose. I had him pose right before our talks with a shirt on. <laughs> Tom, do you want to come up here and stand by that and hold that pose for us maybe? No, just kidding. So, so this is what a reverse replacement is. So you can see there's a metal stem that goes down the arm bone. There's a special coating spray on it where actually your bone grows into it. And I always tell people it becomes a part of you. And attached to the socket is what's called a base plate where it's held there by screws and has that same type of metal that actually grow, your bone grows into it. And then the, it's called a reverse because it flip flops the ball in the socket. So remember how before the socket was on this side and the ball is on this side. You can see now that we've attached that metallic ball to the, to the socket and flip flop the socket for ball. So um, post-op recovery and rehab, I always liken this to a marathon. It's a long recovery. and. Um, I, I say that just so patients kind of realize, hey, it's not going to be like, I always tell people, it's not going to be a McDonald's drive through where you get your surgery and the next day you're back up and running and playing baseball and throwing and lifting and doing things you want to do. It takes about three months to kind of reach that point. Honestly, it takes a whole year to kind of get your full maximum improvement. And the same can be said about hip or knee replacements where it takes that long to get exactly where you want to be and to reach that kind of uh, the apex of improvement. So um, just a few things about the surgery, just in case you're interested. It's it performed as an inpatient or an outpatient at the ASC or at the hospital. For six weeks after surgery, we're waiting on that rotator cuff to heal usually, so we uh, keep you in a sling for six weeks. Um, I have a few things I classically tell patients, and Sean always gives our patients um, these instructions or suggestions. And essentially it is no pushing or pulling. Make sure that you're not lifting anything heavier than a cup of coffee and make sure that you can see your hand in front. If you can't see your hand in front of you after shoulder replacement, you're probably in a dangerous position for that shoulder replacement. Um, physical therapy starts at the hospital to be the day after surgery. And early physical therapy after shoulder replacement is simple where you just move and uh, bend and straighten your elbow and do what we call cobbins where you're just dangling your arm almost like the pendulum of a clock in front of you. And then outpatient therapy starts, it's three weeks after surgery where you meet a skilled person like Dan and he helps you get your uh, range of motion, your strength back. Um, so initially passive motions are allowed followed by active motions. Passive just means the therapist or someone else is moving it for you. Active movements would be you're actually using your rotator cuff, you're using your muscles to do that and that usually starts around six weeks. And then as far as strengthening goes, if you're gonna get weights or bands, it takes, we usually wait around two to three months for that to occur. And again, full recovery can be six to 12 months. So this is my closing slide here. It's simple. My nurse blindfolds me. I spin around a few times and then I try to reattach your tail. <laughs> so I just want to say thanks to you to everybody.